Bitcoin just made new monthly highs as the having hype train barrels ahead at full speed. United States debt has just passed ludicrous levels. And in today's show, we're going to discuss Bitcoin's growing use case in an uncertain economy and the best possible trade setups moving forward. Stay tuned for Breaking Bitcoin. Rockwell for NBTV, and this is Breaking Bitcoin. Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin. We are live every day at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is your daily source for everything cryptocurrency related markets and finance. I'm your host, Justin Wise, lead analyst at CrackingCryptocurrency.com. Hopefully you guys are doing absolutely fantastic on this beautiful day. Today is Thursday, also known as as the Bitcoin pumping day. Before we begin, there's so much that we're going to be talking about. But if you are interested in the markets, if you're watching Bitcoin's price, there's never been a better time to join our community and start building your own verifiable trading strategy. Take advantage of our proprietary indicators like Minx, Time Transformation, Quadrigo ATR, Parallax, our community and one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, premium trading signals for multiple markets, and our suite of educational material and courses. For more information, click the link in the description or point your browsers to premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. Yes, it does look even better on mobile, premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. Like I said, so much to go over. Sorry that we weren't here yesterday, guys. I apologize for that. Again, I had some family stuff that I have to attend to. And again, yes, thank you guys so much. You know, I kind of opened up a little bit and got personal on Tuesday, which was the last day that we did the show. And I really appreciate all the warm messages that I received, the comments that you get. You guys are awesome. This is the best possible community. I'm really proud and, and happy to be able to come here every single day. Uh, and do this job and talk to you guys. And uh, times are good. Times are good. Thank you guys so much. Um, so we're going to be talking about a whole lot today. Um, I think the first thing overall that I want to get into, and, and I want to get kind of right to price because, you know, we just just hit you know, almost 9,700 or 9,700, depending on what exchange you're on. So I want to get to price and analyze that. But today we're going to be talking about ways to analyze average block size and kind of my thoughts upon that. We're also going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, kind of personal security moving forward with the Bitcoin having and the potential. Again, I don't want to say potential, but perhaps perceived potential of a compromise in the security of the network momentarily. If we do have minor capitulation and if, if hash rate drops, I just want people to be aware of the realities of the of the potentials that could occur. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, kind of right and wrong ways to look at network activity, uh, social sentiment towards Bitcoin. Uh, but um and we got a lot of snippets to go over in today's news section, but let's get to the let's get to the markets because there's so much uh, interesting going on. If you guys are new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna, gonna, going to be going over today is Google's algorithm update. And uh, we have noticed issues here on YouTube. Uh, other channels, of course, uh, in the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin field have noticed issues here on YouTube. I, you know, these, these, these word, the word that's been around is shadow banning. But if you subscribe and hit the bell icon, you should receive notifications. And if you hit the thumbs up button, it really does help us get out there and get populated in the feeds because that's an issue not only for us, but an issue for uh, everybody that's covering YouTube and cryptocurrency content right now and never before has it been more important for retail individuals people coming in off the streets to be able to go to youtube go to their their educational platform of choice and find good decent quality content to actually learn about bitcoin to learn how to utilize it to learn how to trade it if that's what they're interested in which is obviously our niche uh and not to be led down into you know you can just see the you know the 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 Elon Musk live 10 million Bitcoin giveaway. And they're at the top of the search results. It's so frustrating, right? But good content gets shadow banned. Anyways, so uh, please support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing the video. With that being said, let's get into today's analysis. All right, so here we are in the live scene. Here we are in the live scene. A lot I want to talk about. Okay, so today's upside break has given us new monthly highs. Um, let's actually... Get this over here. Cool. Yeah. So here we are. Let's just start off on the daily time frame. All right. So today's break has given us new monthly highs. 
This is following along with traditional markets, which are performing quite strongly this morning as well. I do have a long on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ has been particularly strong, even with yesterday's kind of drooping of traditional markets uh, up quite a bit today. Uh, now, overall, kind of the common analysis, the common sentiment that I've seen out there, like most of the charts that I've seen, is this concept of like a four hour symmetrical triangle uh, that broke to the upside. You know, and then back test it. This is the break right here at 9067, and then kind of back tested that area as support. I don't really view this as symmetrical, uh, as a symmetrical pattern. I don't really see a triangle here whatsoever. Again, these are concepts and chart patterns that I don't utilize because I don't think that they actually have a high probability of success. However, this is kind of your uh, basic. Uh, you know, intro to trading stuff that you're going to learn. Uh, typically, all of the education out there is resolved around trading reversals generally and RSI and Bollinger Bands and chart patterns and head and shoulders and stuff that uh, when, you know, analyzed critically doesn't actually have a high probability of success or generally improve somebody's trading. But it is important to know what the rest of the market is seeing and what retail is seeing uh, when they are looking at the charts. Um, OK, so we have now fully recovered. With today's movement, we have now fully recovered from the Black Thursday plunge, obviously, when price broke down in March. Uh, Bitcoin, it, it, it goes without saying, right? We have been shorting altcoins into the ground. And so our BTC stacks are growing quite nicely, as well as I am now. Net, uh, now, <laughs> I wasn't for about, uh, I'd say about 15 minutes there, just right before the show. Uh, but I am now net long on Bitcoin. We'll go into that here in just a little bit. Uh, but Bitcoin is obliterating altcoins. Bitcoin is absolutely obliterating altcoins. Uh, Bitcoin dominance has risen past 67%. Uh, the crypto market cap just reached 257 billion with a lot of that. And USDT is down. All of the altcoins seem to be down. And what that indicates is that people are selling basically anything they can to buy and hold Bitcoin, right? That is what is obviously uh, being shown in the charts and in the statistics, even Tether. Tether is being sold. That's why I said Tether is down. Uh, so not a lot of um, hedging that's being done at this point in time. Futures markets broke 20 billion in daily volume across the major exchanges. Uh, this was after three days of declining volume of around 16 billion daily average volume on our derivatives platforms. And as I said, all eyes are on Bitcoin moving into the halving, right? Alts significantly losing steam, not only against Bitcoin, but uh, USDT uh, as well. And generally, what's interesting with that is that generally when generally a rising tide lifts all boats. So when BTC USD moves up, it brings alt USD valuation up as well. Not now, not right now. At, all, people are selling off their altcoins to get into Bitcoin. Uh, now, uh, I, I do want to state this. I'm not going to put on the moon boots. That's not the guy that I am. I am, uh, you know, a, I'm a trader. I look at everything in terms of risk. However, this is Bitcoin. And if we do push up here, and we'll go back to the VPVR uh, chart here in a little bit, but there is, I, I want to just people to be aware of this. If we do end up pushing up here with what's happening, it is possible that we get that, and you know, full regards to the individual that gave me this terminology, but we call it the whack -a noodle right? We get the whack -a noodle you know, Bitcoin pump uh, to 11,000, 12,000. That is a potential. That is possibly on the charts, right? Um, and unfortunately, with depending on where you're at and depending on how you're positioned with Bitcoin pushing up into the having if this does continue, I think that we're going to see uh, quite a few, if not a significant amount of new all time lows on all Bitcoin valuations because they are being decimated. Uh, all Bitcoin valuations are being decimated. Uh, I do not recommend for people to be holding altcoins right now as a store of value or as a hedge. It is not a good hedge. Uh, they are being decimated right now. And there are a few altcoins that are near their lows, but I attempted a trade like that. I attempted buying a support trade, which is not usually my setup. I'm often quite successful with that. Uh, and that was Litecoin. And Litecoin got smoked to the downside, continuing to get smoked to the downside. So uh, the other setup that I was looking at earlier was obviously XMR, which is coming down to really long term support. And although those trades do look attractive, if again, so there are areas, there are charts out there where if you wanted to catch a knife, quoting senior analyst Alex, who just used these terms just a few moments ago, if you wanted to catch a knife, this is where you'd want to put your hand. That being said, uh, you know, hands are already a little cut up. All right. All right, so let's look at some raw technicals here uh, and get our ideas moving forward. All right, so on the daily time frame, this is the four hour time frame. Let's get to the daily time frame. We're on the spot exchange. And yes, so I got uh, something wrong, right? I was looking the on Monday and Tuesday, uh, on Monday and Tuesday, 
we were looking at the potential exit signal from my breaking Bitcoin trading system. Now that never actually ended up closing as you can see. So yes, current bars will always repaint with any indicator that you have on there. There are ways around this in Pine. Uh, you can design an indicator, but that means that you will have really no idea what the indicator is going to do until the candle closes. So it will look the same all day long until the actual close and then it will change. And that's not a really good way to trade because uh, I prefer to trade, you know, an hour to two hours, maybe 30 minutes prior to the candle close when I have all of the data that I want and where it's all pretty fresh. Um, so not a good, not a good, not a good way to trade in, in my estimation. But that signal never actually ended up generating. Um, I ended up staying spot long throughout all of this. I've been spot long throughout all of this, but I did take on short risk. Now, my short trade was stopped out uh, early this morning, but last night I didn't end up taking a long, right? I was looking at price action, uh, the Cybot automated strategy that we do have up and running now. Uh, we are debugging the final issues with the Discord delivery right now, uh, but the Cybot automated strategy itself is up and running and generating trade signals. Um, it signaled a four hour long last evening. So I took that, uh, utilized the... And the way that we position size, of course, your our position size is relative to our distance to the stop loss, right? So I had taken a short trade with an average entry around 9,200, and my stop loss was around 9,520. And uh, the 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 position size on that was, let's say, medium sized. Then last evening, I ended up taking a long with a much tighter stop loss, same risk level, right? If my tra if my stop loss gets hit, I lose X percent of my account. If my stop loss gets hit, I lose X percent of my account. This is how we position size. This is we have you know hours of content dedicated to teaching our concepts of position sizing. It, and when I say our concepts, I do really mean perhaps the bias, the correct way to position size based on risk. Um, and so the because the stop loss on my long that I took last evening was much tighter than the stop loss for the short, my position size was quite larger. So the net loss from my short trade is now dwarfed by the unrealized, yes, unrealized right now, uh, PL on my long trade that I took last night. And the the way I was able to do that, by the way, was with uh, Bybit. I do all, all pretty much all of my BTC leverage trading on Bybit now. I've done it's, it's been that way for over six months. Uh, they have the USDT perpetual contract right now, which I absolutely love. We've got a couple videos dedicated to talking about this for the premium members in the premium uh, content section. We will be making more content about it, some nuanced applications of hedging. Uh, but with all the hedging material that we have, it's pretty easy to take the knowledge that our members have of hedging and apply it in practice to the USDT platform. But on the USDT platform, you can be long and short simultaneously, and you can also switch over to the inverse perpetual contract where you're holding your equity in Bitcoin and take long risk there as well. But the nice thing about the USDT perpetual contract is that you're holding your wealth in USDT, which is safer. And you, again, you can be long and short simultaneously. So you've got a lot of um, got a, a lot of options there as far as hedging risk. Uh, and all of that. All right, let me check. Let me check something here real quick. Okay, cool. All right, back to the commentary. Uh, so we never ended up getting an exit signal from the breaking Bitcoin trading system. We are bullish on the breaking Bitcoin trading system. We are above the continuation filter, which is the line at which if we close under and then close back above, we can take a continuation signal. Uh, we are above the initiator, meaning that we have an overall bullish bias. We are also, of course, over the baseline as well, indicating that the overall trend is to the upside. Optimum entry area is currently the area between the baseline and the entry qualifier. So the best possible areas for Bitcoin long entries is between 89.35 and 84.60. So you've got about a $500 range there where entries into Bitcoin are attractive, positioning, and then closes below 84.60 or being a little bit more conservative, uh, 83.65, which is the lower Keltner channel that we wrap around our baseline for more accuracy, uh, is where the trend would actually flip to the downside and we would begin to look to short Bitcoin as the trend would now be flipping to the downside. Uh, and that is the main difference between us and other trading strategies and other trading channels is that we are trend following traders. By default, we are not uh, we are not reversal traders. We look to catch uh, we look to trade in the dominant direction of the trend. And that is why, in my opinion, based on other things, the fact that we manage risk is why we have good success. 
with that being said, all right, so overall, the daily does look healthy. Minx, and don't freak out, premium members, if you're watching, this Minx does look a little different from your Minx. As you guys know, I do a lot of, uh, I've been, I've been, I haven't gotten a whole lot of opportunity to focus on our proprietary code. Uh, I've been mostly working on our automated strategies. However, I did have some time uh, over the last few days to sit down and work on the optimizations to Minx, our most popular indicator. Uh, and what we've come up with is really good. So, the uh, this minx the uh, continuation signals are slightly optimized and the take profits so far have the big, the biggest optimization uh, we have improved the efficiency and the accuracy actually of the take profit signal generator uh, quite a bit quite a bit uh, and that required some deep math but uh, but it was well well worth it so minx is going to be signaling for a continuation long these are going to be the default settings of minx that all the premium members currently have access to with uh, the smoothing type as exponential moving average. The exponential moving average code has been slightly modified. We wrote our own custom exponential moving average function rather than utilizing trading views built in default in Pine uh, to have better sensitivity at the beginning of the loop, but I digress. Strength and profit to you too, Scrooge. Good to see you in the chat. Hopefully you're doing absolutely excellent today. Uh, if we look at Wada Atar Explosion, it, we are seeing positive volume delta and parallax. Again, the declining angle on parallax, which was one of the arguments that I had for taking a discretionary short, has invalidated that setup right now. We did stay above the zero line. This is what Alex would refer to as a bottoming above zero behavior, which he likes to look at in our kind of centered oscillators and momentum indicators for signs of continuation of the upside. You know, most uh, famously with, with senior analyst Alex with the uh, time transformation indicator. So. Uh, okay, with that being said, so overall daily looks good. Potential daily reentry signal on today's daily close. Uh, if we do end up getting that signal on daily close, let's bring up Quadrigo ATR as a stop and target system. We're going to keep things very simple here today. We're going to be utilizing just the default trading view 15 period relative moving average for a look back to generate our take profit targets. Uh, and with that being said, let's look at what we're looking at. We would be looking at an initial take profit target of 10,200, followed up by 10,677, and then 11,160 with a stop loss at 9,023. Hmm, I think that is going to... Let me know, guys. Uh, I just turned on those... Uh... I just turned on those, we call them like relay bots in the chat. I don't want them to get too annoying. So I don't really like the fact that they're cross posting to Twitch. So just, just let me know. Uh, keep, keep, your, keep your eyes on that. All right, so overall things are looking quite good. No signs of reversal yet, like we did have over here when we were uh, we were in overbought territory. Uh, Minx, uh, the what I call the optimized Minx entry system, which is exit system, which has now been optimized even further in this current implementation of Minx, which will be released soon, most likely next week or the week after, uh, after I get all of the uh, Pine team, the the development team to look over it. Uh, generated one on this candle right here. Uh, that is not being represented in the current implementation of Minx, which is fine. So this is, again, a better uh, exit system. Uh, yeah, so no no really impending signs of reversal here. Parallax has come down to median. We are not um, overbought. Uh, even if we look at traditional classical technical analysis, let's go over and look at the boring stuff here, like classical TA, BTC USD on Bitstamp. Uh, we can see that the RSI is at 80, so in overbought territory, but currently making a higher high. No form of bearish divergence here in the RSI. The MACD is still trending strongly to the upside. On balance volume is quite positive and rising, indicating that money is flowing into Bitcoin. And the stochastics, in my opinion, one of the worst indicators out there possibly, is in the overbought territory, but has given the crossover back to the upside, uh, kind of that bullish continuation signal from the stochastics. So overall, even traditional analysis looks good and of course uh, our, sim our uh, simple exponential moving average our I said simple exponential moving average what I mean by that is a simple moving average strategy with a 10 period exponential moving average and a 20 period simple moving average crossover and to indicate directional strength and uh, where the stop loss or excuse me where early exit should be placed so pretty good strategy in and of itself very basic strategy but effective uh, and following along with ptp methodology you can do that all here with your basic uh, built-in indicators if you prefer i have to lock my chair because i do not like going back remember men don't slouch right nobody likes to see people slouch if your wife 
Men, if your wife is not listening to you like she used to, it's because you're slouching. Ladies, if your husband is not listening to you like he used to, it's because you're slouching. All right, with that being said, let's get back over here. Uh, let's go look at the two hour and look at current momentum. Obviously, we're having a very, very, very nice pump here. Uh, a lot of good positive potential here. We're about to actually hit uh, soon, uh, hopefully take profit one on our current long position trade, up all the way up at 9,800 now already, blasting past 9,700, blasting past 9,600. So really kind of happy to be uh, net long on Bitcoin right now at this point in time. Uh, here on the two hour time frame, we can see bottom feeder signaling all throughout this range. Entry on this candle, obviously nailing it. Uh, entry on this candle. And we can actually just use the, um, we can use the replay feature for this. All right, so here we go. The nice thing about bottom feeder, obviously, all the premium members are aware of how this works. Whoa, hello. That was a little too fast. Let's just slow it down there. About one second. And we'll go right here. <laughs> So the first signal generated by bottom feeder. So there's the signal. One would take the trade right here. One would be entered right here. And as soon as we reach the take profit, the lines disappear. Everything resets. Here's another long signal generated by bottom feeder. Boom. Should get some should get some music for this. Bottom feeder doubles up in this range. As you can see, two entries. Ooh, comes very close to the stop loss. This well, this one was a loss. This is what back testing looks like, by the way. Boom, take profit right there immediately. Speed this up just a little bit. And that's where we're at. Yeah. And here's where we're at. Okay, so yeah, overall bottom feeder's been doing well in this range, but no signals from the Cybot. The last Cybot signal came in right here on this candle and caught this whole rally to the upside. That was the two hour. Uh, the four hour did even better. Let's see here. Yeah. Last four hour Cybot signal was actually right here and sweeping the range. Now, Cybot actually signaled for a four hour long last evening, which again predicated the long, gave this exit signal while I was sleeping. Uh, and unfortunately, although this was a profitable trade, uh, you know, here's the entry. And, and although it is, you know, almost a 1% trade, again, you know, held on to that. Uh, by the time I woke up, we were already doing well, so just keep the risk open. So things are good. And then bottom feeder only signaling once on the four hour time frame, this low right here, as you can see, nailing it for this setup or this setup again, or again, potentially you could have played this kind of double bottom back down to the uh, bottom feeder generation signal and rode this up all the way. So four hour and two hour is looking okay. No signals so far, except riding the four hour signal still and uh, quiet on the eastern front as far as the two hour goes. Uh, now the 45 minute chart is interesting. Uh, this is the ISIS spot running on the 45 minute chart and we'll look at VPSV here in a little bit. Uh, overall, the ISIS spot is usually almost, you know, highly accurate for one to 2% movements as we can see. Uh, the last uh, short signal was generated here and then we didn't hit the stop loss so that trade would have remained open and then we would have got that nice 2% trade right there. It did signal again here. Uh, and again, this is a trade that I took with about 0.25% risk. Uh, this trade obviously was stopped out. Uh, just again, just during the show, you guys have seen that small short risk trade. Uh, but again, overall have been long since last evening around 93, around 9,300. Around 9,300 is when I took my 2% risk long trade. And again, of course, still spot long on Bitcoin overall. Uh, and, you know, I'll be honest, and this is something I was discussing with the analysts, looking at the signal this morning, again, I'm an objective trader, so I just, I trade, I trade signals. But then, you know, coming down here to the really low time frames, the micro time frames, here's the five minute chart. And as we can see, 
following this pump on Bitcoin right here. And this, you know, what's funny is this is exactly what we were talking about. This is exactly what I was talking about with Jason and Alex right before going live. Uh, here is, as you can see here on the five minute time frame, you know, we're consolidating. This is the BitMEX funding and premium index. So after this large sell to the downside, we can see that, uh, pre, you know, uh, premium, excuse me, um, the funding rate does slip negative uh, and the premium goes into backwardation, right? There's no premium. The price on deriv derivatives exchanges, the futures for Bitcoin slip into backwardation, meaning that they're cheaper to that the, the price of Bitcoin is cheaper on the uh, the last traded price on the futures than they are in spot. Generally, that is a good area to be going long from because it means that shorts are getting too aggressive and they're likely to get stopped to the upside and vice versa when there is a high premium on Bitcoin's price on the futures. This is a social sentiment style of trading. Um, and as we can see, following this kind of first rally today, uh, we can see that look how I mean, look at this, the yellow is the um, backwardation on Bitcoin's price uh, derivatives to spot. And look how high it's look how high it was spiking. And this is right around where it was actually right about here where we got that short signal. No, it was right here. Here's where we got that short signal. And I was looking at this and I was like, man, price is in backwardation, meaning that a lot of individuals are attempting to aggressively short this movement to the upside already. And they are most likely going to get smoked. So if I were going to trade this discretionarily uh, and try to get a better entry, I would look at that ISIS bot short signal, wait for the uh, and, and note that price has reached the threshold for a short, wait for a pump to validate the fact that shorts really need to get squeezed here because too many are trying to short at this higher level and then take the trade. So, you know, realistically, if I were trading that more discretionarily, I would have waited until a movement like this uh, to put on my 0.25% uh, risk short scalp there. And that's fine if you guys don't want to do that. That's how I enjoy to trade, you know, looking at all the different options, especially now that uh, we are rolling out automation and, and bot strategies a lot more to complement our manual trading strategies. And that's honestly the way that I do. I don't like the idea of putting all of my eggs in one basket with any kind of uh, with any kind of uh, automated trading strategy. But it is a great complement to help you out, uh, you know, as my friend Gunbot Wally says, to work the wick for you. Uh, or, you know, as as my as as um, as my other friend who, who trades a lot of bots says, you know, to to do stuff while you're asleep, right, to handle things while you are asleep. So uh, and that's, again, what we're working on rolling out to be uh, a complement to our manual trading strategy. So again, Bitcoin taking a hit in the nose here and just popping right back up. So again, having hype in full effect, guys, this is really just lovely price action to see. Uh, this is again, and Bitcoin will do this right, you know, and this is again, just no, maybe not again. This is just as somebody who has traded Bitcoin for years, as somebody who has traded for years, the you know, you'll notice nuances in certain markets. And Bitcoin is an asset that will just go crazy. And the market, again, old adage, the market re can remain um, illogical longer than you can remain solvent. The market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Uh, and this is why we are by default trend following traders. You know, there is a lot of money to be made if you are good at catching reversals, good at scalping, good at playing the range, all of these kind of things. But the overwhelming the overwhelming amount and volatility of movements that you get out of Bitcoin when they when it trends and you if you just trade in the correct direction, identify the trend, use the baseline for that and trade in that direction. Not only is the trading easier, um, it is, it's less stressful. It, it is more profitable. It is simply more profitable it is a more successful trading strategy. And yes, uh, good. Well, two good points there. Damian Hughes saying trading crypto is not good for sleep. Yes, we've all been through that phase and senior analyst, Alex, uh, chiming in over there saying that's why you use good position sizing and risk management. So you can finally sleep at night. That's absolutely correct. All right, obviously CME Futures has a blown past the gap. We consolidated right at the top of that gap fill. So this is kind of obviously looking back. We can see this consolidation near resistance is generally bullish and we got a very nice volatile movement up thrust out of that. <laughs> Did you see that on the five minute there? They're going just sliding right on up there. Market buys, market buys. And the SPY, listen, obviously traditional markets are helping out very uh, uh, quite nicely, right? So this is the uh, S&P 500 E-mini Futures. This is the ES. And... Uh, price is 
uh, doing quite well, right? Uh, you know, the, the traditional markets are opening quite strong today. I'm up about, I think, 4% on my NASDAQ long, actually. I'm, I'm trading the, uh, the TQQQ uh, ETF, actually. So my ETF trade, to be quite honest. But the underlying is, of course, the NASDAQ index. Uh, Renko for uh, Bitcoin is quite bullish and has been since uh, the 4th of May. May the 4th be with you. And Ethereum has been kind of choppy, chopping around. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. As I said, altcoins getting decimated. I think that there is a potential uh, on the table today for an Ethereum long. I was looking at that. Uh, I was looking at that earlier today as uh, a potential trade setup to take, you know, Ethereum to the upside. However, uh, you know, it's, I think, I just think there's too much uncertainty, particularly I, you know, we were looking at maybe even taking FBTC or FM20 to the upside. I just, I just don't feel that that's a good, um, that's a good investment at this point in time with too much, uh, with kind of too much uncertainty. Good time says Ethereum is up 5%. Yep, you are absolutely correct. And Bitcoin is up 7.66%. So just in general, I think with what's going on right now, although Ethereum is maybe of all the altcoins, the one less least negatively affected because most altcoins are getting decimated by Bitcoin going to the upside. Uh, it's just more profitable, I think, right now. And it makes a little bit more sense to just trade Bitcoin. However, again, you know, Ethereum is of all the altcoins, the one that has the potential to outperform Bitcoin. So again, it's just a it's just a preference of risk, I think. And for me, the decision was no. The decision was no today. Uh, Boris Bitcoin says, hey, if today's daily candle closes at this price point, which would be around 9,800 at, at time of writing, at time of writing, like you're writing a news article. I love it, brother. Would one still take the continuation signal? And the reason why is because therefore price appreciation or gain, total gain on the day, uh, would be, well, hold on, let's use the right words. You're, like price appreciation is greater than the daily ATR. You mean the, the, the true range of the, of that, of today's daily candle would be greater than the average true range. And the answer is it depends, right? Um, you know, things like the entry qualifier for the baseline and things like the no trade, uh, conditions for the baseline, like candle size dominance uh, or candle size violation and above qualifier. Those are all recommendations. So individuals are going to need to test those. I recommend that if you are new, if you are building your first trading strategy, that you have all of those on so that you have the safest possible trading system. And then as you become more familiar and i.e. more successful with your trading, you can become more aggressive. And more aggressive does not necessarily have to mean larger position sizes. You may find that based on the sensitivity of your initiator or the combination the sensitivity of the combined signaling power of your initiator confirmer volatility filter baseline combination that the baseline qualifier makes sense for your trading strategy based on your baseline you may find that it doesn't make sense so that is a uh, that is a safe option that i enable by default for everybody and that i invite individuals to discover through back testing whether that makes sense because there are going to be some strategies where that's too restrictive there's going to be some strategies where that is a great filter so you know i want everybody to have their own unique personalized trading strategy because that is what's going to give you the most confidence when you've built it yourself there is a framework that's what ptp offers that's what our pathways to profit course offers there's a framework for how to build these things that's what we teach um however selecting the individual components uh, is going to come down to the individual and what filters they choose to run with are going to come down to the individual. Um, I would, pro I would take the trade. Uh, I feel with, with Bitcoin's appreciation and going into the happening, I think, as I said, I'm being cautious here, but I am not, uh, in denial of the fact that Bitcoin could continue to accelerate here and put in more significant gains going into the happening. It's not a for sure thing that we're going to have a big post having dip. There are some key fundamentals that are hard to ignore here. And again, as a technical trader, I generally dismiss fundamentals, but I'm not blindly dogmatic, right? 
uh, there are some there's some big economic things going on. And of course, you've got all the traditional analysts that are coming out and saying, well, this is all priced in and everybody knows about the Bitcoin having and you're crazy if you think that Bitcoin's actually going to outperform, you know, the traditional markets. And you're crazy if you think that any investor that knows anything is actually considering Bitcoin a store of value. And while all of that may be true, it, it, it does not behoove us to forget why we're here in the first place. Very few people that are watching the show and very few people that are trading Bitcoin right now are here because they just wanted the gains, right? That is a reason that many have come into the space and might be one of the reasons why you're here. However, most people that are here are here because they know that Bitcoin is something special. They know that there's something about this technology, about this blockchain that has the potential to change the world. And we're all, for the most part, most of us, on that same side. Understanding that there are significant issues with the traditional banking and financial system. Understanding that there are significant issues with our current level of debt, with fiat currency, with sovereign money printing with government intervention and manipulation of the free market and that Bitcoin that we're not just giving lip service to this whole Bitcoin's going to change the world and be a new form of money. But that is actually on the table. And most people, when they come into trading, I've noticed this kind of get so jaded by, well, hey, man, yeah, you came into Bitcoin as we're going to change the world, but you're a trader now and we're we're realists over here. Look, Everybody acts like they have the world figured out. At the end of the day, nobody does. There's not a single person on this planet who can tell me what happens when I die. There's not a single person on this planet who can tell me how the universe was created. There's not a single person on this planet who can explain to me why everything happens the way that it does. Everybody is generally, everybody who says that they are is smug and ridiculous. So... I am a realist and a cynic. However, I believe, I believe we can change the world. And I believe that means we can go to 12K tonight. Let's go. Philly from Manchester. Good to see you, my brother. Uh, Blue Box Territory. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, what's the target in this move? Uh, currently targeting 10200 so we're about $300 away from that right now. We'll look at VPVR here in just a second. Uh, good times. Formerly known as Challenged Investor. Good to see you, my friend. Christian Zeladon says, ADA is the best protocol with a crown. BTC is the best first blockchain. Rocket ship. Unsure face. Hey. Not going to lie against that. Okay, uh, so we talked about a whole lot, a lot of fundamentals there, a lot of stuff to go over. Let's look at a few stats. Uh, let's look at the uh, VPSV while we're here. Uh, here's the volume profile. We are approaching the top. Let's look at this. We are approaching the top of what I consider the red box resistance territory right here. Uh, we talked about this earlier. I and you know, listen, you know, uh, this is this is what I was clearly saying for weeks leading up to this, right? And yes, looking at the daily because that's what I trade. I took a discretionary short position, but I remain net long, or uh, yes, net long and spot long throughout all of this because my original thought, and you guys remember when I was asked what happens uh, when we were down here, I said if we enter the bottom range of this this red box territory, if we break above eighty two hundred, we're most likely going to accelerate right to the top of the range, and that's exactly what's happened. That's exactly what's happened because this, although it's a resistance cluster, is an acceleration area, and we've already had a retest of our back the truck up area down in the green box, uh, our three thousand to four thousand dollar range uh following black thursday so we've already primed the pump we've already gotten the long-term fills people have already had the chance to buy at 3k right like bitcoin is that kind sometimes and uh here's the thing breaking above ten thousand is is what we need to see like a strong close above ten thousand is obviously what we need to see 
And if that happens, that could be a catalyst that pushes us to a new all time high. Really could be, you know, right now, the most logical thing to assume is that we reject from here like we have the last four times we've come up here and batted about. Obviously, the last time we had this much momentum was back. Well, we were coming off a much stronger bull rally at that point in time after the, the previous consolidation at 3000 and, and the drop to 3000 following November of 2018. Uh, but that was summer of last year, right? May or excuse me, June, July of 2019 is when we last topped at 14,000, uh, rejected, consolidated in the red box, uh, had a uh, brief dip down to the yellow box, the fair market value of Bitcoin at current valuation, uh, ran back up, rejected from the top of the red box, and then all the way down to the green box quickly, very quickly. So. Uh, I, you know, listen, I mean, the signs are here, like the technical signs are in that, you know, if we break 10 K this time, I mean, it's, it's likely that we reject at least initially, but just like, you know, you guys will remember six K, right? Remember six K? Like, remember when we were down here and everybody, even me was pretty certain, like, yeah, looking at this man, looks like we're going to run into some resistance around six to seven K. Nope. Bring right through it. So, you know. Technical analysis is not reading the tea leaves and anybody that ever tells you calls themselves a trader or a chartist. <laughs> if you run into anybody that's like, hey, man, what do you do? Oh, uh, I'm a chartist. Do you want to buy my course? No. Tell them no and run away because that means that they make pretty lines and they're not an actual trader. Uh, traders, people like me and people like my like team members, we talk about risk and statistics and P&L and how much money did you actually put in? Like, we don't we don't care where the line is on your chart. Uh, the market doesn't care either. So with that being said, sometimes I listen, but you know, sometimes the, sometimes the lines are good. Some lines do matter sometimes, right? They're good for having an idea of where we're at, right? All right. So with that being said, there's a whole lot to talk about. A whole lot, whole lot, whole lot to talk about. Um, we're going to get into the news. There's a lot that I want to cover uh, with the news and what's going on currently fundamentally around the world and with Bitcoin, a lot to talk about. Again, if you guys are enjoying the content, make sure to support the channel by liking the video. Today's video, you can hit that thumbs up button. If you're on YouTube, uh, sharing our content to Reddit, to Twitter, to your friends, your family, people you don't even like, don't care, uh, and uh, subscribing and making sure you hit the bell icon. We do highly appreciate that. If you're over there on DLive or Twitch, you guys can give us a follow. Obviously, if you got Amazon Prime, you can get a free subscription to our Twitch channel and you get the Twitch sub role in Discord, which is always cool to see. Uh, also, uh, you guys can follow us along with our trades. As I said earlier, I do trade majority of all my Bitcoin derivatives on Bybit. I love that platform. The advanced things that you can do with USDT uh, by holding your wealth in USDT are amazing. Uh, I hate I, I really dislike the BitMEX platform. I do trade some alt uh, perpetual features on there. And again, that's most likely because I'm a creature of habit and because I'm familiar with the platform. But we all know based on the new reports that are coming out, BitMEX is losing ground. Obviously, Arthur Hayes. Maybe it's not him. I'm, I'm not blaming him, but it is what it is. BitMEX had to shut down their system. They've been fraught with issues from for a long, long time. Like the, you know, the, the system overlord, system overload. It's just a complete uh, disaster over there sometimes. And obviously following the Black Thursday, the most busiest trading day, BitMEX had to shut down and the liquidation engine almost crashed the price of Bitcoin to potentially zero. So uh, yes, BitMEX has been losing steam. So uh, I would recommend you support them in that. So anyways, let's go see how junior analyst Jason is doing with his Bybit trading. And we'll be back to follow the news. Can't catch a break over on BitMEX with all the wicks? Try a better alternative at bybit.crackingcryptocurrency.com and rest easy for a change. All right, for today's cryptocurrency segment, obviously there is four days, five hours, 59 minutes, and 24 seconds at the time of recording in two until Bitcoin's third having event. Bitcoin's third having event. So, Again, having hype, we can see it in the price. Keep your calendars uh, marked, guys. We are going to be having... Um, we I, I got to think about how we're going to do this, but I'd like to have a having party, maybe a... Um, 
maybe quite a long live stream, uh, bring on the analysts, bring on some team members, maybe even bring on some premium members, just kind of do something special, you know, a real, um, you know, kind of chill uh, live stream event. We can watch videos, we can look at the price, we can look at the charts, we can chat, answer questions. So maybe do something, uh, maybe do something really special here in about four days. So let me and the team talk about that. Uh, and I think that's something that we would really enjoy to do. All right, uh, let's talk about... Um, excuse me. All right, so this right here... Excuse me. This right here is a... This is right. This right here is data from uh, blockchain.com. Uh, so we're going to look at the... I, I like looking at the... Um, the 30 day moving average, this is the average block size in megabytes. And if we look at all time high, we can see uh, kind of the technicals of this and we'll break this down in a little bit. Let me actually see if I can't. Oh, I don't really like how that is doing that. So let me do this. Sorry, guys, just one second. Okay, there we go. Uh, so here's the average block size in megabytes. Now, average block size is an interesting chart to look at when we are considering Bitcoin fundamentals. Now, it's not a perfect chart for measuring what we could loosely call network usage. Uh, it is, however, very easy to see the rising trend in Bitcoin block size, which we can infer simply to mean increased activity. Now, interestingly enough, the last sort of all-time high in overall network activity was mid-summer of 2019, as we can see right here, when Bitcoin reached its swing high, its last swing high on the higher time frames, around 14,000. And with this halving coming up, this actually might suggest to me that Bitcoin is actually a little undervalued at these prices. And what's exciting is the knowledge that with a SegWit network, this can reach two megabytes and ideally beyond. And you know, to go into that a little bit more, the reason why it's not such a simple measurement of of you of network activity, if we want to use that term loosely, is because we have a couple different things. Well, mostly you have the difference between like, you know, was a did a transaction, did a bundle of transactions, a, you know, a block that was created by a miner have a lot of transactions in it, or was it just a simple one, right? So, did you make kind of a big Bitcoin payment uh, with one input, or did you have a ton of inputs? Um, uh, which which most non-UTXO blockchains would just call transactions. But in Bitcoin, you have bundling of transactions. So by default, sorry if your eyes glaze over, by default, you have a, a base 200 bytes on top of which you can add transactions, which are 20 bytes per transaction. And again, these are known as inputs uh, because we have a UTXO-based blockchain. Bitcoin is a UTXO-based blockchain. So blockchains like Ethereum would just call these inputs the transactions. So what that means, though, is that this data this chart could suggest that either we are having more uh, increased increased network activity um, or that we're having more inefficient uh, use of constructing blocks and bundling transactions. However, I think it's pretty safe to say that it's the former concept that we certain that this chart is uh, very simply a good representation of increased network user activity. And again, if we wanna glean from that, that our average block size is nowhere near where it was the last time we peaked, the Bitcoin's price is actually a little undervalued. And we've got quite a, a bit longer to go using these on-chain metrics. Now, I, I wanna talk a, a brief moment here about personal security, right? Remember, we don't know exactly what's going to happen following the halving. We've covered a lot of concepts on this channel. Uh, you know, the, the catalyzing capitulation of miners, a potential drop in miner hash rate, or the idea, very rarely, uh, unlikely in my opinion, that the miners do kind of have this all figured out and the ones that are going to shut down, they're going to shut down okay and maybe it's all going to be a progressive transition to the new order of who's going to mine and blah, blah, blah. Unlikely, we're probably going to see some chaos. But remember, that following the halving, it will be a little wild west out here in Bitcoin land. The effect on miners cannot be accurately predicted. Now, this will potentially dramatically and immediately alter their profit streams. This again will force inefficient miners and small operations to potentially shut down or start dumping excess Bitcoin onto the market over the months of May and June. If there is a rapid drop in hash rate due to a plunge in mining activity, a real or perceived, most likely, I don't expect a real, but perceived compromise to network security could occur. So 
What are things that we can expect when there is an overall kind of so look forward over the next few months to see a lot of fear articles and FUD about Bitcoin and network security and 51% attack BS because it's not going to happen on Bitcoin. But what you should be wary about is an increase in things like ransomware attacks, phishing, other means of manipulative extortion over the next few months, as I expect demand for Bitcoin to ramp up, right? And again, not only for uh, not only in, you know, legal, normal ways, but also in nefarious ways, i.e. phishing, um, ransomware. Okay. Now I want to talk about the social sentiment, getting back to the Bitcoin having, I want to talk about the social sentiment toward Bitcoin, uh, and how it's, it's really, you know, kind of being bolstered along by the current coronavirus pandemic and the way that traditional markets are performing. Now, back in 2008, passive investors with 401ks or pensions or just general stock holdings, watch their net worth just get wasabied, right? Right. <laughs> um, and we're seeing that again, right? We're seeing that again here in 2020. And if we look, you know, not just us, but anybody who has access to uh, the internet, it's like, you know, they log into Fidelity and they're like, wow, that 401k is down quite a bit. And then there's a little pop-up that's like, Bitcoin up 100% this year. Bing. Why was I holding all of this Apple? I could have bought this Bitcoin thing. Honey, honey, what's a Bitcoin? See what I mean? This is happening around the world. These are the conversations that grandparents are having. Okay? Because they have to, right? You know, people generally, retail individuals, regular folk, don't know anything about markets. Like they know... Like they don't even know what Goldman Sachs does. They're like, what is an investment bank? And that's fine. They don't need to know, right? But just like back in 2008, you have grandma and grandpa talking about, well, I think the reason the collapse is because these collateralized debt swaps and you know, or credit default swaps and you know collateralized debt obligations words that they they don't understand they, they they shouldn't be using those terms i should not be hearing my grandmother ask me what a credit default swap is like like grandma like you're on you're trying to do kobe when you need to be doing like you know neighborhood basketball calm down um but these are the conversations that these economic realities right when it when the when the crisis hits your doorstep when you are actually losing money now you're incentivized to do your research and do your homework. You know, this is why those individuals react when they're in loss and why they generally lose because they're not well prepared. They don't have foresight. They don't do research. Whereas us in this room, in this channel, generally are forward thinking and we've done our research and we're in before. So we get rewarded for our early investment in Bitcoin. That's how it works. You know, early investors, early speculators, early risk takers get rewarded. If we're right. And we were right about Bitcoin. Um, but again, I don't mean this to spread like a negative narrative or that you guys should certainly don't be cocky or arrogant or think that you're better than anybody. You should use your position of knowledge and involvement with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin to help educate other people and realize that everybody else, just like you're watching Bitcoin bounce back and you're like, man, I should have bought more at 3K. Other people who don't know anything about Bitcoin are watching and saying, man, I should just buy Bitcoin right now. And that's a good thing. Right. You know, uh, this this whole this whole idea, uh, you know, this there's this narrative like if you told anybody to buy in December of 2017, you're a terrible person. Well, no, I mean, anybody like you, you should. It was fine. Like, it's totally fine. If you bought some Bitcoin at like 19,000, who cares? It's fine. You know, obviously you're wrecked if you went all in on Bitcoin, but like maybe just be a little bit more patient and wait for price to go up above 19,000. You don't think it's going to happen? Uh, and again, that's going to happen to anybody. Anybody who goes all in at any one point in time, like that's not a that's not an investment strategy. That is that is a lack of responsibility. That's that's rolling the dice at the casino table, right? On anything. Doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or Google stock or Alphabet, excuse me, uh or, you know, the the spy. It doesn't matter. Like you don't go all in. Um but if you told somebody about Bitcoin and told them to start buying Bitcoin in December of 2017, and they would have just dollar cost averaged from then until now, they'd be doing pretty well. 
and they would be nice and geared and prepared for whatever lies ahead of us. Whether it's a rip-roaring bull market like 2017 or something to put 2017 to shame, or whether it's 2018. Now, <laughs> but everybody watching Bitcoin bounce back over 100% this year so strongly from the crisis-induced plunge that, that knocked the other markets as well bolsters this narrative of Bitcoin as a safe haven asset, right? Not only in your mind, but in the mind of the public. And that means new investors who want to diversify their portfolios and flee what they think is a reserve currency the United States dollar, that they are now beginning to perceive is fraught with peril and they don't know what's going on around the world. So, good things to consider there. Uh, let's see here. Let's talk about, uh, this is just kind of a notable mention. Uh, famous, this is from uh, u.today. Famous Bitfinex whale leaves crypto Twitter. Read his farewell message. Let's... Uh, Let's see if we can get the, let's see if we can get just a second. I'm on the wrong OBS scene, but. There we go. Let's give a, let's, you know. In the arms of the angels. And fly away from me. He was the bid for next will made millions on stream. We gotta have fun around here. All right, so uh, Joe007 uh, clocking out of Twitter uh, for, for for reasons, I don't know. Uh, but he has said that he is giving his goodbyes to crypto Twitter. Uh, obviously, you know, he's been around for like six months. Uh, he's been pretty funny to watch on Twitter. Uh, you know, he's he's a shit poster and he's an arguer, but he's got some, you know, he's 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 just funny, funny to follow. Right. Uh, and it's been pretty fun to uh, it's been pretty fun to watch him swing from, you know, down 10 million, up 10 million, down 10 million. Right. Sometimes live on stream. So. All right. Uh, our next story. So obviously. Obviously not a big fan of, oh shoot, the doves are still on. I would have like left them on for years. Uh, so obviously I'm not a big fan of Craig Wright, but for those of you who don't know, Craig Wright has been accused of plagiarizing some 30 pages of his doctoral thesis. Now this was broken by medium user Painted Frog and I will put the link in the chat and also put the link in the description. I'll put the link in the description following the show, uh, but definitely go check this out. Uh, now, this was, as I said, this was broken by a medium user, uh, Painted Frog, who did the investigative work and broke this. And, and it appears that, again, like most plagiarism for college or university purposes, he just replaced words with synonyms. Now, Charles Stewart University, who gave Wright his PhD, is going to be investigating these claims. And if found to be true, have said that they will rescind his degree. Now, keep in mind, Wright often cites his academic credentials to bolster his fraudulent claim that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. So really looking forward to just anything that can be done to throw sand in this guy's face. This is not a guy that you want to invite to dinner. Okay. <laughs> York, can we bring back the birds? Um, we can. We can bring back what the stream is going to look like if we can uh, look at what the stream is going to look like pretty much all day if uh, Craig Wright is found to truly have plagiarized his PhD content. And that's in a news article somewhere. It's going to look just like this. With me saying, I knew it. So let's talk about United States national debt. This is the United States national debt clock. As you guys can see, as of this morning, United States national debt 
uh, has passed $25 trillion for the first time. Uh, that means that debt per taxpayer is currently sitting at two hundred over $201,000. So if you're an American taxpayer, you are theoretically in debt $201,000. Interesting, interesting to note. Uh, let's see if I actually have that. No, we'll get to that here in just a second. Uh, stimulus checks that were used. Obviously, the American government, if you guys are non-American, uh, which is fine, we're a global show, but stimulus checks were given out by the American government for about $1.2,000 per person, an extra $500 for every kid that you have. Um, I received my stimulus check. Um, stimulus checks that were used to buy Bitcoin are now worth $1.6,000, right? So this was originally $1.2,000. Bitcoin has provided American citizens a 33% return on their government payout in less than a month. <laughs> now, for the record about these numbers, that uh, at over $25 trillion in debt, that is the Fed adding $24 million of debt to the future American taxpayer, right? Again, I'm sorry if I do not understand modern monetary theory, but debt is a tax on future generations because bills come due. And if you believe that you can infinitely print money to pay debts, that all works until another nation comes in and challenges your sovereignty, which will inevitably happen. So overall, it is a sustainable idea if you believe, if you can somehow lock down, well, as a nation, we're just going to be on God mode forever. Well, you don't have that cheat code, man. Your nation is never going to be on God mode forever. Eventually, you're going to tumble like every other empire that's ever been out there. So that means that means it is an unsustainable way to build a society. You need to build a society around the concept of sound money, regardless of, you know, the idea of despite Despite all arguments against it, you, you have you have to you, you have to build an economy on sound money. You have to have a sound financial system. And the idea that you can't do that, the entire Islamic world does because they don't allow usury, right? They don't allow debt or excuse me, interest. So the idea that you have to have interest, which means a debt based society to run an efficient financial system is wrong. Uh, we can just look on the other side of the world for that. So. Uh, according to the U.S. debt clock, again, as I said, every American taxpayer is now $201,000 in debt. Good read, by the way, although I do disagree with it. There are some good facts in here. Uh, good read here about uh, China's uh, CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, the DCEP, the Digital Currency Electronic Payment System, which we've covered a lot on this show, uh, and, stance, and China's stance on crypto. Now, while I do disagree with a lot of this information, not the information, I disagree with the writer's predictions on how things will pan out regarding China's DCEP and their goals for the digital one, it is, uh, Uen, it is still a good read, and it's important to ingest contrary information, right? Otherwise, you just get brain locked into being biased and only believing what you have been taught to believe, right? Highlights from this article are that Libra accelerated adoption of blockchain in China and accelerated the progress of China's DCEP. Uh, China has this new blockchain-based service network. Uh, it is not what you think. It is not a blockchain. It is centralized. The digital UN is centralized. It is actively being tested, and it is expected to strengthen China's economy, and this will decrease reliance on the USD. Now, this is, we agree up to here. We disagree here because the author speculates that the DCEP will not see mass use and won't be used to spread Chinese economic influence against the world. And I think that that is ridiculous. This is absolutely what China wants to do. Like what nation would not want to be more powerful? There's nobody out there that's like, hey, do you want to be more influential? No, nobody says that. You know, this is why, you know, the infamous like the devil comes to you. I'll give you anything you want. Riches, power, women. Yeah, 99 percent of people are going to say yes. Yeah, whatever. Soul. Yeah, you can have it, man. Take this thing, dude. Give me those riches, power and women. It's very, very hard to, you know, be, you know, moral. It's very hard, right? That's why we idolize people who do it, right? You know, you got Buddha, Jesus Christ, you know, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, right? The list goes on and on and on. Now, uh, <laughs> China is still skeptical on crypto uh, is something that we, of course, agree with. Now, other notable mention, the Tron Foundation is in some hot water this morning after allegedly receiving $2 million. Now, obviously, the Tron Foundation is kind of like this global um, entity, uh, but they do have a United States San Francisco based um, corporation uh, called. I don't know what I don't I actually don't know what it's called. It's the Tron Foundation in America. It's a blah, blah, blah type thing. 
Yeah, that's a technical term, blah, blah, blah type thing. Uh, but uh, Tr the Tron Foundation allegedly received $2 million in a government-backed PPP loan. That's a payroll protection program loan from the SBA, the Small Business Administration. Uh, the payroll protection program, for those of you who don't know, was part of the COVID stimulus uh, relief package. And it was designed to allow small businesses to receive low interest and, in some cases, forgivable loans to stay in operation, particularly to have funds to cover employee payroll, uh, interest, uh, utilities, things like that. However, the PPP itself has come under fire after a lot of allegations, and there's even talk of a lawsuit right now, that many large corporations have actually taken the most advantage of this program, not small businesses, and therefore uh, many small businesses that actually need the funds um, a lot more will not actually be able to receive them. Uh, and obviously the Tron Foundation, which is not even really based in the United States, uh, is getting $2 million in funding was a little kind of on, on the nose, especially with how profitable the Tron Foundation has been. However, to be fair, I mean, the other more tolerant argument is that, well, listen, they have United States arm, they have United States employees, and they are just as entitled to apply for the PPP loan as anybody else, because it's not like the entire, like every other business was affected by COVID and not Tron, just because we don't like Justin Sun. So, you know, again, chime in on how you feel about that down below. A lot of, you know, you either like Justin Sun or you hate him. Most people hate him, uh, at least around this channel, it seems as a general sentiment. Um, you know, again, I, I don't really have a strong opinion on this. Uh, you know, I would certainly say that the Tron Foundation isn't a huge corporation, uh, you know, regardless of the fact whether they have, mil you know, have being, you know, millions is still small business, you know, like small business, you know, is not just like, oh, you know, it's the family run gas station. Like certainly those individuals need money. But economically speaking, there's also, you know, kind of you, know, you got to look at like, OK, what generates more cash for the you know, for the economy? Anyways, maybe the Tron Foundation doesn't. Maybe that's the worst possible people to be getting the PPP loan. Let me know how you guys think down below. Now, uh, this next topic is probably going to get this video shadow pan, so link to it uh, if you, uh, you know, if, if you want to catch it later. Uh, Google's algorithm update appears. So Google just did an algorithm update. No, coin speaker, I do not want notifications. Uh, so Google just released an algorithm update. Uh, and kind of the fire right now is that Bitcoin news is uh, getting uh, censored and banned, right? So it, this new algorithm update appears to be blocking a lot of Bitcoin news and related topics from appearing on Google search. And as a crypto YouTuber, uh, I know that other YouTubers are feeling this as well as reports of what we're calling shadow banning, uh, decline in viewers, decline in subscribers, decline in subscriber, or, you know, subscribers not getting notified when we go live or post a video, um, us not showing up in feeds or on our own page when we post a video uh, is occurring across YouTube to small and big players in the space. And I will admit that we on this channel have also seen this and felt this, right? We have seen a big drop off on our views. Uh, you know, prior to all of this, we used to, you know, have a thousand, uh, sometimes more um, daily live viewers. That number has dropped quite a bit. Uh, we routinely do not appear in feeds. Our subscribers do not receive notifications or regularly report that they do not. Like, we don't even show up on our own page sometimes. Um, and we have had other YouTube-related issues like copyright strikes. Uh, not copyright strikes, but... Um, uh, just strikes, community guideline strikes for no reason, for like absolutely no reason. Like we reviewed, like the team goes over the video that was posted every single time. And there's even like so, the ones that they cited, like I don't even curse. I don't curse a lot because that, that's I try to monitor my language. But, you know, it slips out every once in a while. Right. I said shit poster earlier. So. Uh, yeah, this is happening, right? This is a, this is a big thing. And we really appreciate your support for, you know, for getting the news about sound trading and Bitcoin related fundamentals out there to the people that do need to know this stuff the most right now. So we do appreciate it if you do support the channel by sharing our content, you know, direct linking uh, and letting people know. So, you know, in case it gets taken down or uh, in case you just can't find them in the feeds uh, and doing the regular YouTube things, you know, like liking, hitting the bell icon, subscribing. That really does help us out, especially with everything everything that's going on. And thank you guys so much for your support uh, and helping us to spread this message across there. So, and guys, we're almost there to 50 likes. Let's get bullish on that like button. You know, it's 15 more likes. Let's get us there to the 50 like mark. We really do appreciate that. We can do it, guys. I know you can do it. Look deep into your hearts. You got that power. Uh, now, we've been following the Telegram token launch for quite a bit after, you know, pretty much losing, well, not pretty much, but absolutely losing their battle with the SEC. Uh, Telegram did end up launching their token just now with a different name called, I don't know, uh, Free Ton. Yeah, Free T-O-N. So that is, that's there now. So you guys can go uh, take a look at that. 
Uh, and, you know, just an update, we covered this uh, Grayscale consuming a lot of uh, the mined cryptocurrency, but Square and Grayscale combined have gobbled up 50% of all the Bitcoin mines so far in 2020. So clearly, clearly um, stocking up for the long term, Grayscale and Square. Uh, and overall, just to have their own reserve because the demand, uh, <laughs> Damien says, I'm holding my upvote for the one hour candle <laughs> I gotta wait for that confirmed signal on the like button, man. Let's, uh... Just a second. Let me pull up the links for... Oh, that's gonna kill my neck. Hey, man, did you guys see that? Ooh. All right, so our, you know, getting into our big cryptocurrency segment, this is our, our big story. So for our first story, I wanted to take a look at this Forbes article uh, titled, Is This the Perfect Time for Central Bank Digital Currencies? And, you know, considering the context of the times that we live in, um, when it comes to matters surrounding coronavirus and the current pandemic, Forbes is declaring that this is an opportunity for government to begin implementing digital currencies right now, that this is the time to get these uh, CBDCs out there and that they are going to be an inevitable result as government continue to escalate their their fiscal response to the widespread economic damage that has been wrought by coronavirus over the last few weeks. Businesses shutting down, job losses soaring, future growth looking bleak. Uh, where did I just put that link? Sorry. So, you know, back at the end of March, the International Monetary Fund officially declared that the global economy has entered into a recession. And since then, we've seen Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, the California governor, the C.D. Howe Institute, all sounding the same recession alarm bells. Very, very tight information. Philly, thank you so much for the two quid, my brother. In order to respond to all of this, governments across the world have deployed aggressive stimulus measures, starting with aggressive rate cuts and providing emergency liquidity to markets, followed by bailouts for Main Street, with checks being mailed to individual citizens. Now, what comes next for the economy could begin to resemble nationalization of industries, the retail sector, uh, or supply chains in general, nationalization of these aspects of the economy. Now, while the government's response has been unprecedented and it may very well soften the economic blow, it also might potentially fuel Again, it might fuel a sharp recovery in Q3 and Q4 if indeed things do blow over very quickly. You know, the idea of the government funding every family in America to the tune of thousands of dollars per month per household has actually become very fashionable whether or not the crisis is resolved quickly. Like this idea of universal basic income is very, very popular nowadays. Um, and government bureaucrats and policymakers who find themselves holding the reins of power in the economy are now in kind of charge of making the decision of who goes back to work and who remains shuttered. This is what we've allowed to happen. We've allowed the government to gain these reins of power and make the decision based on a virus that we don't even have good numbers on. And a lot of people in today's world are arguing that that's a good thing, that government should be in charge of making major economic decisions and even be responsible for providing individuals basic goods and services, that it's their job to provide what we need, not their job to protect our rights to go secure our own. Now, this is where the concept of a central bank digital currency can really take hold, unfortunately, though, and gain political traction, right? What better way is there to make well-informed policy decisions about the economy than by leveraging an unparalleled insight into this, uh, into the spending habits of your citizens via a centralized database executed by a CBDC? Right. This offers central planners unprecedented insight into the economy and individual uh, purchasing habits. By harnessing the power of these digital currencies, government officials will basically be right to believe that they have obtained a far better sense of key business activity in the economy. And that gives them insight to where money is flowing and what is drawing investment. Now, this information 
the big data wet dream that digital currency brings with it helps governments or allows governments to pinpoint what industries or areas of the economy need the most attention, idealistically, while also making it easier to track and evaluate in real time what effect any economic stimulus that they're providing is actually having, right? So in this article, Forbes spoke with John um, Ladaluce, uh, Idaluce, sorry, founder and CEO of the private equity firm Bands Capital, and he emphasized that you know, basically the dazzling possibilities presented to government by CBDCs. And he described their potential as undeniable. According to Ida Lucha, the, you know, U.S. policymakers and citizens alike see that stimulus checks are faced with huge roadblocks, which could be solved via CBDCs. Could also be solved by Bitcoin. I digress. Uh, let's go to the next. Link here from Market Watch to carry this forward. Now, according to this Market Watch story from late April, the Internal Revenue Service has only recently begun mailing physical stimulus checks to American citizens. But according to a, a, a House Ways and Means schedule, distribution is projected to take as long as 20 weeks. 20 weeks. And these sort of delays can be extremely inconvenient at times like this. To say the least, CBDCs would offer the promise to politicians and their hungry electorate that the government bread can be distributed quickly and effectively using these CBDCs. In other words, the public and our leaders are very receptive to this idea of removing barriers to giving people free money. Or as Ida Lucha puts it, these digital currencies provide citizens access to these payments in a fraction of the time through a streamlined, immutable monetary system, right? It was already mutable because the government has the, you know, the army behind them. But I digress. Immutable for the government, not immutable for us. One way immutability when you're using government currency. Now, it seems that politicians are now, of course, starting to finally take notice because if we go by this article, congressional representatives have tabled 32 cryptocurrency related bills in the past year alone. Now, back on the Forbes article, Forbes went on to speak with Matthew Dibb. Uh, he's the co-founder at Stack, who is uh, Stack is an asset management platform, who said that central bank digital currencies not only back on the positive side, right? He would he said that CBDCs not only help with the distribution of stimulus checks or could help with the distribution of things like stimulus checks, but they also open up the door to novel monetary policy initiatives such as airdrops to the people, you know, what we know as airdrops in cryptocurrency, airdrops to the people to stimulate spending on the fly, right? You know, like government politicians are like, hey, you know, like Minnesota ain't spending a lot of money. Like we're not getting a lot of time. Let's just spread it out there real quick. In Minnesota, airdrop, 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 airdrop. Now, according to Dib, injections uh, like this, central bank digital currencies into the economy could be done in such a way that the money cannon gets aimed directly at specific industries, making, uh, stimulating them, economically, <laughs> that much more effective. Um, and as Ida Lucha reported or noted, we've recently witnessed heavy amounts of capital flow out of the travel industry, and it took place faster than the unprepared economy could track. And the result, the result to us as the taxpayer was a $25 billion bailout. But according to him, in a CBDC environment, the government could be alerted to an impending domino effect from something such as tumbling airline industries. With transactions being categorized and calculated, the government can move in a moment's notice, like the flash, kind of like the, you know, totalitarian overlord flash, to prevent economic disasters. You know, because we don't have a sound monetary system. They could just give us a sound monetary system, but no, yeah, we, we, we can patch it up. It's okay. Now, despite all of these potential benefits, just waiting for our economic stewards to discover, most digital currency most digital currency enthusiasts like myself are offering dire warnings about the negative consequences CBDCs could have when it comes to matters of privacy. And that's not just consumers, but business as well, right? Quoting Jake uh, Yakum Pyatt, that's the man behind the Decred blockchain. Um, Since CBDCs are necessarily centralized, this centralized control over the network would give central banks access to an unprecedented amount of data about individual and collective transaction patterns. Now, while 
There are potential positive aspects to this, right? Like, for example, an ability to be more accurate and measured when issuing credit where it is deemed necessary. There are also a myriad uh, there is a there. There are also myriad negative privacy implications. This centralized control means that individuals or groups can be instantly flagged, surveilled, and even deplatformed economically, all at the whim of the central bank. Author you know whether whether it's them, their their own authority, or agents of the central bank. That is the treasury or any government legislator who gets this power in their hand. While individual commercial banks for all, you know, while individual commercial banks for all their faults still offer a buffer from government overreach and some competitive market forces to retail banking still remain compared to the decentralized stuff we are used to in cryptocurrency space. Central bank digital currencies present, you know, major uh, from the perspective of policymakers as opposed to decentralized crypto. The advantages that CBDCs offer on their face, right, prima facie, is in terms of transaction speed and transparency to authorities, right? But this largely comes at a cost to privacy and autonomy, which is, you know, the point of decentralization in the first place. Now, adoption of central bank digital currencies to distribute stimulus will ostensibly be used to claim the government is being responsible in its disbursement of such fortunes. Of course, you've always got the right that comes in and says, well, the government spending is unaccounted for. It's terrible bookkeeping. And if there was just better bookkeeping, things might be a little bit better around here. Audit the Fed. So, yeah, there you go. They're going to use that as the excuse, right? They're going to use that as the reason to implement CBDCs. Because they're like, well, you guys have been saying that our bookkeeping has been terrible. Like, well, so we're going to get better bookkeeping. We're going to have a central database where it's all immutable and on the blockchain. You know, after all, these modern digital ledgers boast transparency and accountability and therefore will allow the government to claim it is less prone to corruption or mismanagement solely thanks to the advances provided by this new age of digital currencies. Right? Not through means of their own, just through this man. So soon, politicians are going to be finding themselves at odds with their electorate if they oppose digital currencies. Because again, you're going to, you know, everything that I just described to you, which sounds good for the government, is going to sound good to any normal person because normal people don't care about privacy. Unfortunately. Again, just as I said earlier, right, you know, retail individuals don't buy Bitcoin until they actually lose money from their investments and they see that Bitcoin did well and then they buy Bitcoin. They don't most people don't actually go out and do the research on their own to learn about what's new to be a pioneer. Most people are comfortable being spoon fed. So. As times continue to get worse and as things get a little bit more desperate, political forces are going to start playing with the idea of a permanent subsidy to every household here in America, and you will indeed see broad political support for such allowances and central bank digital currencies that make them possible. But still, the sweeping adoption of CBDCs under the auspices of fiscal stimulus and economic rescue is going to move consumer spending data almost certainly out of the hands of private companies and the payment systems that are currently being used to trace it and track it and move it all onto digital ledgers that central governments solely monitor and control. So, while we don't enjoy a lot of privacy right now, do not think for a minute the existing system isn't harvesting every little bit of consumer data it can on you. It's going to get a whole lot worse when Big Brother has sole domain over all of the metadata of the entire economy. So, what we've outlined here is that the public support for a digital fiat may be building under the radar right now as we speak. But we do have to remember what the cost to privacy will be and what the overall direction for the economy is that this is all steering us towards. Then, of course, there's the matter of privacy. There is a meaningful difference between the transaction data being collected across a variety of private companies and their payment networks versus the transaction data that will all be held in a government monitored ledger with each account clearly assigned to a particular citizen. You are Rick C-137, right? So where do you guys stand on the CBDC issue? Do you too think that this is inevitable and pretty soon the average electorate is going to be demanding 
uh, a digital fiat. And the politicians are going to be more than happy to oblige. Make sure to let us know in the comment section down below. I'll do my best to reply to you guys over the next two hours. And of course, you can hop in the Discord and chat this out live. And our last story before we end today's show is going to be... Uh, just a brief update here. The team over at BitMEX Research, which is the analytical branch of the derivatives trading platform BitMEX, well, they have published a detailed report concerning their research into Ethereum 2.0, its design, its operations. Now, Ethereum 2.0, of course, is an ambitious and significant upgrade for Ethereum that is many years in the making. And it marks the platform's transition to a proof-of-stake consensus algorithm from a proof-of-work consensus algorithm. And this BitMEX report looks at how the sophisticated new design became the only option forward for Ethereum's development community when they were looking to scale. And how much time will be involved in this transition. Now, the researchers at BitMEX agreed with the core conclusion of Ethereum's developers that sharding is the only way Ethereum can respond to growing centralization of its network, as well as addressing the throughput issue. Let's, uh, let's actually pull up a link for that. So here's the actual report from the BitMEX blog. Now, sharding is the concept of splitting up the network into dozens of interconnected blockchains. And what's being addressed is this threat or fear of centralization of Ethereum's network based on how proof of work is currently deployed on ETH. You know, with the ever increasing complexity of operations performed on Ethereum, the pressure on mining and other equipment is such that centralization is fast becoming a concern for the network. Therefore, this transition to Ethereum 2.0 and sharding has become now an inevitable stage in Ethereum's vision to become and remain a decentralized world computer and help move the blockchain project forward. Of course, the radical departure from the current proof of work system deployed uh, as Ethereum deployed on Ethereum is going to ruffle some feathers. And that's where some of the potential problems in the scheme begin to surface. Now, first of all, not all Ethereum users or stakeholders are impressed with its world computer approach. With a move to proof of stake fundamentally changing the network security model and sharding hasn't convinced everyone that it is the way to solve scaling challenges. Many still feel that Ethereum may struggle to find appropriate business-to-business -business use cases to merit all of this scaling and future direction in the first place. Now, BitMEX research points to Ethereum 2.0 requiring its own new smart contract architecture to operate, and existing contracts will not be able to live inside the new network. And worst of all, according to them, the transition will be a painful one, which will last years because you have to switch everything over. Now, to some degree, this report strikes a very skeptical tone with Ethereum's ambitions, but it does point out something very true. And it's that Ethereum investors and visionaries love to experiment with new and complex systems, be it the DAO, ICOs, Maker, and now DeFi. So with Ethereum now five years old, many in the community have expressed that Ethereum may be falling behind and they want something new and are open to adopting kind of new and experimental ideas. Therefore, they expect a considerable amount of investment and resources to flow in to support even the most ambitious roadmap 
ahead of this Ethereum 2.0 sharding project. But still, this is a good read as it summarizes well what the next few years are likely to hold in store for Ethereum, what the 2.0 rollout is going to look like after all, and what it, you know how it's expected to begin as early as July of this year. So if you're an investor or a hodler of Ethereum and not too up to speed on all of this ETH 2.0 sharding and proof of stake business, I do recommend that you give this BitMEX research a read. The link will be in the description below. And it's well worth, uh, it's well worth, you know, pouring over, over your afternoon coffee or tea. All right. With that being said, guys, whew, it is 1.30. We did a long show today, guys. Thank you guys so much for all of the support. Thank you guys for joining me for another episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Analysis. Sorry that we didn't have a chance to get to live questions today, but the day drags on and we've got things to do. Uh, I want all of you guys. Uh, to know that uh, it's going to be a good time, Zed, guys. A lot of exciting opportunities out here. Never been a better time to trade. Never been a better time to work. If you are sitting on the sidelines and you're not having the success or the results that you want, uh, there's never been a better time to join our community. Start building your verified trading strategy today and learning to trade the way that we trade. You can find more information with a link in the description or go to premium.crackingcryptocurrency. Dot com. We always appreciate the support. Make sure to like the video on YouTube. If you guys are watching, let's hit 50 likes. If we haven't done already, we can certainly do it before the end of the show. And if you share, excuse me, if you subscribe and share this content, we really do appreciate it. It does really help us out. There are links in the description to all of the things that you would possibly need in your journey, uh, whether you need to secure yourself with a crypto tag or a ledger, or whether you want to trade on Bybit the same way that we do. Uh, we will return tomorrow at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, or death threats, leave them in the comment section down below. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Trade safely.